All right, we're continuing in the book of James. If you want to go ahead and open your Bibles to the book of James, chapter 4. We'll pick up there, <clears throat> do a little review of topics, catch ourselves up, and then move on in tonight's copy. Uh, topic, copy, copy, topic, topic. <laughs> i got to practice words sometimes, you know, get it out of my brain. This is a great book, great book of little lessons on how to take ourselves from an immature status spiritually to growing ourselves spiritually strong into the image of Christ. And it's a progressive, it's really difficult to just stop and just keep breaking this book up in these little lessons because he didn't stop the conversation from last Sunday to this one. I did. Whenever we divide the Bible up, we're the ones that divided the books up. This is another one tonight between chapter 3 and chapter 4 where we see that uh, the conversation, if we just stop and go, okay, well, I read my chapter for the day, and then you wait for two or three days later, and then you pick up and start reading chapter 4, verse 1, you, go, you could kind of go, well, okay, well, we start out with this other thought. No. That's exactly what happened in chapter 3. When we go back there, we can see that, and we'll discuss that. So we look at the topics. And the very first is the idea of the suffering persecutions, that they're going to challenge us. They're going to test our faith. And that we need to be able to ask for wisdom without any wavering, having total confidence, not back and forth. Um, then he talked about hearing and doing, not hearing and just believing, hearing and doing nothing. But if you hear it, you hear God's word, you act upon it. You act upon it. And then there's this sin of partiality where some people are showing favoritism, whether it's by class status, which, you know, that could happen as well during the church in Corinth and other churches. This isn't written in one particular church that we're aware of, but I just mentioned the Corinthians. We pick on them a lot anyway. But that idea that there can be, whether it's through education, social status, maybe politics, maybe your sports team, you know, but we always have little things that cause us, and that's detrimental to us as a group of Christians. And then coming back again, he brings up faith again, not only hearing and doing, which your hearing is your faith, but hearing that's actionable. You're acting upon it. And then he brings out that, that amazing concept that the demons even believe, but they're not saved. They believe. And saying that, yeah, you, you believe you do well, but so do, the, so do the demons. They believe as well. And then the taming of the tongue. Oh boy, what a little beast, you know, the way he describes it. We all know what that's about. We all have issues with it. It's so hard to control it, to keep it under, under control. But he introduces it with the, the flow again of maturing. And some people who believe that they could be teachers, when really their tongue is causing more damage. They think that they're humble, they're not but how much power there is in the tongue. And that somebody who is going to teach, they need to understand you're going to be held to a higher standard when it comes to judgment because of what you say. Now, you know, it doesn't mean that if you've got a speech impediment, it doesn't mean that if you make some mistakes, what he's talking about is people who are arrogant, that are going to believe that they're better, and so they're using their tongue or eloquence or some other aspect of their mouth to help to influence what people perceive of themselves and not try to articulate it exactly the way God is trying to express it to us. Now, in that last week we looked at wisdom. Now, that, that flowed together with the tongue because if we jump now and we go, let's jump over and look at the kind of wisdom, but the wisdom has to do with the way that we interact with one another. So when he says not many of you should become teachers, He's talking about faith and action. And then when he talks about the tongue, goes through three here toward the end of it about how that there's an irony there that you can use the tongue to bless and, and be very kind and then turn right around with the same mouth. You curse. And he says, you know, you can't have a salt spring and a fresh water spring. It's polluted. It's either one or the other. And that flows into the idea of then wisdom. Where does wisdom come from? And what is wisdom? Wisdom is the ability to take knowledge, information, experiences, common sense, and then apply them as you're trying to carry out a task or a process or whatever it might be. If it's changing a tire, well, you know, the wisdom would be, wisdom would be, well, I know mechanically I have to have a jack, I have to have a wrench to break the lug bolts, I got to have, okay, I got the knowledge, but if you're like me, when I did my first one, I forgot one item. 
block the will. <laughs> Crack the lugs before you jack it up. Because then the wheel just spins. So I had the knowledge. I knew I had to break, you know, crack the lug nuts before, you know, I needed to take it up, but I forgot you need to do that when it's still on the ground. Well, I'll tell you what, after the first time I did that, I got that experience. I had the knowledge. Next time I changed the tire, man, I had it down. Much better. Same with our faith. When it comes down to the idea that, you know, as we're learning, we're listening to God's word, we're acting upon it, we're going to gain experience. We're going to be able to see it in reality. In, in real time, really, and help to bring that out. So, you can have wisdom that's coming from God's Word, knowledge, because every one of these, these two wisdoms, they have one thing in common. They have a source of knowledge. That's the one thing where they differ. What's the source? From God, it's from above. And so it gives some illustrations of some ways that you can look and see by the way people are behaving, where's their wisdom? They may have skill, and they may have ability, they may have common sense. But if their knowledge is based off of the worldly knowledge when it comes to helping, advising, and serving, mm, it's going to be different versus one that's from God. So you could have the same person, have all these other aspects of wisdom, but a different source, you'll have a different outcome. And so that's what he tries to bring out, is that idea. So now we're still talking about wisdom. Everybody wants to be wise. We think of Solomon. We think of the ability. Nobody wants to, you know, be that guy that has no common sense. You know, he knows it all, but he can't really do anything. You want somebody to say, yeah, that was pretty smart. Maybe not call you a, a wise person, but, you know, you want to be able to take information, use some common sense, and apply it, whether it's cooking, baking, working, whatever it might be, helping somebody go through a difficult time, all of these things. So now he's talked about the sources. And the one thing I want you to remember from last week is you can always tell where the knowledge for that wisdom is coming from by the fruit, by what you see being produced. If you see hatred, anger, strife, <laughs> I guarantee you that, that James says that's not from above. Because wisdom that comes from above, he described as being peaceable, gentle, and long-suffering. Hey, doesn't that sound like the fruit of the Spirit that Paul talked about in Galatians? Absolutely. So that's one thing. And now, he continues the idea of the results. The results of worldly wisdom. And every family that's a normal family, every workplace that's a normal workplace that has real humans working, not robots, you're going to have problems. Churches as well. Churches that have real people, you're going to have problems. You're going to have people who are living according to the way that they have grown up and the knowledge that they have, the experiences and all these things. So now he's going to talk about, look at the results of this. Why is that important? Well, first off, when you were a group of Christians working together, when I see somebody that's being mean, ornery, you know, uh, not really nice to people, um, not bearing with one another, you should start to go, hmm... All the actions then that they're doing is not from above. It's not coming from a source from above if they're holding on to stuff. But what's the effect when it comes to the collective? That's the dangerous part. So I'm going to read the whole text, and I'm going to read, I'm reading from the NIV, but I'm going to apply and look at using the ESV. So I hope it doesn't confuse you too much, because I like the way that it, the two together help to bring out some of the nuances of this. So I'm going to read the, the text. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have. So you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you don't receive. Because you ask with the wrong motives. That you may spend them on what you get on your pleasure. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means an enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be the friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think the scripture says with reason, without reason, that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? 
But He gives us more grace. That is what the Scripture says. God opposes the proud, but shows His favor to the humble. Submit yourselves, then, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, well. Change your laughter into mourning and your joy into gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister judges them, speaks against the law, and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There's only one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? So it's really talking about the way that we interact collectively. And there's always those problems that we have in trying to get to know one another. And you know what? Even some families, that families, no matter what age they are, can be difficult. There's gonna, they're just never going to be complete harmony all the time. But people need to go back and consider, when you start to see the effects of some of these things he just talked about, where are they coming from? When you start to see yourself, start to have some of these these symptoms, you need to ask yourself, where is this coming from? Because there's one that's coming from God, and there's one that's coming from the world around us. So let's go back to verse 1. Now, we don't know why they're fighting. He doesn't say. He never says anything about you know, what was causing it, but he asks the question, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Hmm? Don't they come from your desire that battles within you? So, kind of rhetorical. Well, the first part is, I mean, if somebody asked us as a group and said, why do you guys quarrel and fight? And you'd go, well, who? who were we arguing? Was it you and I? What was going on? Well, does it always have to be just outward verbal? Sometimes the contentions, you know, are you know, under the surface, or they're there. But, you'd have to ask yourself, okay, if we are having them, then you ask, well, what causes them? And that's a good thing. Well, if it's my side, it's you. Right? It, it's, it's her. You know, not me. That's why we're fighting, because she just doesn't, or he doesn't get along or agree with what I'm saying. They're not willing to yield to what I'm saying. Comes back again, to then he says, don't. So it's kind of like rhetorical. Where do they come from? Don't they come from the battles from within? So it's like refocusing, telling us to come back. Now the Apostle Paul in Romans 7, I think, does a great job, and we are familiar with this text, of seeing the way that we have this inner battle from within us that we have to be very aware of to try to keep ourselves from losing control. Paul said, in, starting in Romans 7, verse 23, he says, But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind, and making me prisoner to the law, the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? And the, the whole application dealing with law, but I think that we have had these type of inner struggles where we know what's right to do but we don't do it and then all of a sudden it accuses us and then we feel guilty about it and then we feel bad about it and so you know if there was no morality that'd be awesome wouldn't it because then I could do what I want that's my this is one of my evidences that there is a God because morality is not an evolved trait it's not something, if anything, if it was survival of the fittest, whew, you in trouble, because it's doggy dog. I'm going to do what i got to do, and I'm going to be the big dog, and I'm going to win, and I'll be the survivor that will be able to create more children that will be like me, that will be mean and surviving and tough. That, that, that's what 
evolution is survival of the fittest. Uh, God's not that way. God's, you know, I don't care how weak you are. We love you, and we're going to help you. We're going to take care of you. So this, I think, shows that within us, we do have this inner battle where we struggle within ourselves. And so it's emotions. It's personal. So the source of our fights and bickering is because I have emotions against what you believe or want. You've got to admit it. That's where it starts. It's the first initial feeling. I call it kind of that gut quench. You just kind of, when somebody says something that you're not real happy about, you don't feel real good about, you just kind of get that mm, little shot of adrenaline like you. And then it's very easy, and I hear this a lot with people, and they start assuming that it's a personal attack. Somehow this is personal. Maybe it is, but to assume it, you don't know what the person's motive is behind what they just said and how they define what they're speaking about. But we don't give a chance, do we? Mentally, we're already on guard. Aha! Aha! You know, you're, whoa, whoa, whoa! You know, we're already, like, going after, and why is that? Because it's about me. It's about me. It's not about you. Instead of saying, wow, I didn't really like that, what he said, but let's consider it for a moment. No, we get defensive, and that's where, because it comes from desire, from within. I may have a very strong belief in something, and you just said something that uh, insulted it, or not, not like insulted it, but speaks completely against what I believe in, or what I think about that topic, or whatever it might be. I've seen that with passages, you know, where you're having a discussion with Christians on Scripture. And one brother has been raised to look at a particular passage from wee little boy, you know, our girl, and that's the way they've always been taught. And one time I was in a class, and I was teaching the class, and afterwards a person came up, and they were very upset at my position and the way I thought, and they were emotional. I mean, it was like you could see, you know, almost blood veins if they sticking out. They were, they were upset about it. One, they assumed what I was saying, which was wrong. And then when I explained, no, that's not what I said. If you recall, this is how I said it. But, no, no, game on, man. Game on. It was like, once I had said it, it's like, the fight's on, man. That's not what that verse says. That's what he was sitting there doing to me. Not, you know, and so he comes up to me after the class, and he's like sitting there talking to me, like almost cornering me, and you could just see this emotion flowing out of him. Like, rah, 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 and I'm like, I almost wanted to say, calm down. Take a deep breath. Let's talk about this. And then when I listened to him, because I wasn't being offended by it, I, I, I had that gut check. I'll admit it. I was ready to fight. I was like, and I sit there and I go, just shut it, Ron. Listen. When I listen, I realize what he thought I said. By the time I got done, he was extremely embarrassed. And he was still sweating and you know, almost flushed but because it was something that he didn't agree with. And then once I explained it, we still didn't necessarily completely agree on it, but it changed the tone. And that's about as close as I could probably bring. But just imagine how devastating that could be to a group of people if this is going on and we're not being able to work through those problems. And that's what you see in a lot of churches. People just disappear all of a sudden. Or they, they go somewhere else and start saying, well, you know what they're teaching over there? That other congregation? They don't teach that. What are you talking about? The person never came in and even talked to me about it. it. No, no, it becomes very personal. And that's the lust, that's the desire that starts this conflict. And it starts where? It starts in us first and foremost. So, then moving on in the next two verses, he says, you desire and you do not have. Oh, that's, you know, you ever had one of those nights? Now, I'm going to expose myself. I've wanted those moist chocolate brownies. And I walk around and they're nowhere in the house. They're gone. The little munchkins ate them or something. And I'm like, I had my mind so set. They're so moist. They just melt in your mouth. And so I got up, and I went into the kitchen, and I walk up, and it's gone. And I'm sitting there going, I can't have it. 
I can't get it. You know, you think, okay, Ron, you know, I'll pout and get over it. No, an hour later, it came back into my mind. I'm still wanting it, and I'm still desiring it, and it's almost like it just happened all over again. I had that same type of feeling. So I, I desire it, but I can't get it. What does that create? Stress, frustration. You can't satisfy it. That's the point. You can't satisfy it. Remember, this is an internal conflict that we're dealing with, so that's what he's trying to bring out. Now, here he says, and then you murder. Now, I didn't kill anybody in the search of a, a brownie, okay? Nobody died, but I had some pretty ugly thoughts. Mm-hmm. I, you know, thought about certain animals that eat too much, you know, and I didn't get a chance to get mine. But I didn't murder anybody. Do you think these guys are murdering? Well, let's think about it. If we go to John 1, 3, 15, the Apostle John says, anyone who hates his brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. Hmm. So, we also know that Jesus had taught that the fact that when you hate somebody, it's, that's, that's killing. That's the equivalent of it. And I think that's kind of that, that idea that, okay, you're not starting out that way. Maybe it's not as grotesque as we think physically, like you pull out a gun and just shot somebody. But God says that type of an emotion of disagreement and then building up to hating is that equivalent of destroying your brother. Now, when it comes to, he says, you ask, you don't receive because you ask with the wrong motives. How many times, parents, has your kids come and ask for something? And you know the motive is not right. You know it, don't you? That, that there's something wrong with their motive and you're not going to give it to them. And it's about the way and what. Because it, it's nothing to do with honestly helping to improve the quality of their life make them more productive or helpful to them. You, we can see through that. And that's kind of what we do sometimes. We have to remember that when we're asking and we're not receiving, now it's not that every prayer is not answered because of wrong motives. Every prayer is answered. I think we just don't see the answer. I really do. But it's answered. And if you're, and you're praying with the right motive... It's going to be what the best He wants for you and you're going to get it. That He wants for you. But here, people are saying that they want stuff, but they have the wrong motive. And then, He says that they also, you know, are asking it because they want pleasure from it. And there is that aspect to it. Even in the church, certain things you may want you know, maybe it's a nicety. Maybe it's, maybe it's something that, yeah, it'd be nice to have. I'll tell you one right now. Hot water in this building. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't it? Ooh, yes. Trust me. Go wash your hands right now. In the summer, not a big issue. But we have never had hot water in this building. I don't know. Well, we did have one hot water heater, but it went south and we never replaced it. And I don't know how many times I thought, man, it'd be so nice to have hot water in this building when you wash your hands. And you know what? What does that have to do with accomplishing anything when it comes to preaching the gospel, making disciples, and taking care of one another? Okay, your hands will be warmer when you shake somebody's hand. It's a nicety. So somebody to throw themselves on the sword and go, I got it, we, we just need to get hot water. Well, we can't afford it. Look at our budget, right? I mean, if we had the money, okay, let's, let's put hot water in all over the building. But for somebody to go and really want to push that issue, well, we, we just, we just got to get hot water or something. Now, trust me, it's, that has been kind of discussed and never become contentious. But there's been a few little other things that have come up over the years, similar, certain things with the building that, Somebody would like to have changed or have something modified, and, and they're pretty passionate about it. Now, I wasn't the decision maker on those, the ones that I'm thinking about. 
but they got a little disturbed, got a little upset because the elders at that time were not going to do it. Did I have anything to do again? You know, I kept going back to thinking the fundamental purpose of this facility is to provide a safe place that's basically, and it is, warm and cold as appropriately, light so that we can read, that we can worship, we can sing, so it's doing what we need. So, again, that's where I'm, I'm just trying to use some examples of where he talks about this. But if we do, we need to start out like what John says in 1 John 5, 14. This is the confidence that we have in approaching God. So every time you go to pray, I want you to do that. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. We know it's there. And it's going to be responded and reacted to. Key thing is within his will. Because his will is going to satisfy our biggest needs. Not the way we might think so. So he gets a little more as he moves to the next verse in verse 4. A little more verbal. A little more excited about this. And he says, You adulterous people! Do you not know that friendship with the world is an enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. I want to put this out there because this is kind of inferred sometimes. Can you have a friend that's in the world and, and not violate the Scripture? He's not talking about people. Okay, that's what I want to bring up. He's not saying, you can't have friends in the world. He's talking about friendship with the wisdom of the world, friendship with the morality of the world, and the values of the world. You cannot be in peace with it. That's what I want to bring up, because I actually had that mentioned to me by somebody, not a member of the church. It was like some other different religion. I was just blown away. I'd never looked at it that way, and I thought, uh, it was kind of obvious to me that he's not talking about individuals, because Paul talks about somewhere else where he says, you know what, if, if I'm talking about you not associating with people in this world, then God would have to take us off the planet. And aren't we here to save them? <laughs> so you're going to have to be friendly with them so that you can bring your your love from God to them so that they will see your example. So this, that's, that's just nonsense. But look what he says when he says adulterous. Immediately we go to the sexual. We think somehow this is a sexual infidelity. No. It's spiritual. You have to go to the Old Testament and you look in Isaiah like, in, like one passage, just one of them. In Isaiah 54, verse 5, he says, Therefore your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is His name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. He is called the God of all the earth. It's a very bold proclamation that Isaiah is saying. That is who you are wed to. When you're in a covenant relationship with God, then you are married to the body of Christ. So if you're friends with the world, you're cheating. So when James says... You know, you're an adulterer. That's what he's talking about. You're not being faithful to your heavenly Father. So then he brings in the wisdom of the world, of God. He says, Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the Scripture says he yearns jealousy over the Spirit that he has made to dwell in us? But he gives more grace. Therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So it's kind of like, don't, don't you think this other thought means anything? You know, you think that this devaluates the point? In other, and so in my words, the way I would say it modernly, is, do, do you think that what we're talking about then diminishes the fact that God is jealous for your soul? Now, here he says spirit. And there's a couple of thoughts. Is he talking about your, your spirit individually as Ron? Or is he referring to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? 
to me, both. You, you want to go either way, but to me, both of them. Because God is very jealous about our spirit. I think the way that it's kind of phrased leans a little towards the idea of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. Because Paul talks about that in Corinthians, saying that do you not know that the Holy Spirit dwells within you? So there is a part of that, and we've talked about the Holy Spirit. He also talks in Romans about the Spirit dwelling in us. And as Christians, he is saying that he has placed that in us. And now we turn around and we're unfaithful to it, and we treat it that way, our bodies being the temple of that holy and precious spirit. So, he is a jealous God when it comes to his children. And then he says, and because of this jealousy, then that's when God says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And again, we know this is a large conflict. Talked about it a little bit this morning too, about the idea that how we have this conflict between pride and humility. Nobody wants to be humiliated. Everybody wants to be proud of what they do and who they are. And that can move off into some dangerous territory with self-ego and self-worth that shouldn't be there when it comes to God. If we will humble ourselves before Him and others, not just God, but we need to humble ourselves between, uh, among each other as well. And so by doing so... He gives us more favor by being humble. So it gives him a solution now. Now he moves in verse 7 through 10, gives him the solution. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Okay? Submit yourself. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and let your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will exalt you. He's not saying to be mournful and pitiful and sorrowful. What He's saying is consider what you're doing and it should cause you to be sad. It should cause that type of response. But it starts with first submitting yourself to God. Yielding to what He wants, not what you want. And then you have to resist Put up a little struggle, people. You know, it's kind of like, come on. Because like, I feel like Paul, you know, when he talks about, you know, he knows not to do it, but guess what? He does it. And what James is saying here is put some resistance up. We know Paul was able to. We know Paul continued to have that inner person battle, just like we do. But what Paul was able to do is resist. Just put up some resistance. You don't need a cross, <laughs> you know. To go after the devil. What you need is a little bit of effort to resist. And with that little bit of resistance, what does he say he'll do? He'll leave you alone. There's a lot easier targets out there. There's a lot easier. And all it takes is just a little bit of effort on our side to push away. With submitting, resisting, now it's time to clean ourselves up spiritually. Our hands in reference to what we've done. You've been out working on a car. You've got grease on your hands. Clean them. You've been out working in the mud. They're filthy. Clean them. Make them good again. Come before God. Don't bring your greasy hands. Don't bring your sinful hands. Don't bring those hands that have murdered your brother. Wash them. That's kind of the imagery is clean yourself as you come before God. Draw to Him and guess what he's going to do? He's going to come to you. Isn't that a beautiful picture? You know, it, it, it reminds me of the prodigal. When the prodigal is afar off, and the father is standing there and he's looking out, and he sees his son coming, what does he do? Wait? Oh, okay, well, he'll get here in a little bit. No, he ran to him. And that is us. Now, it doesn't say here in James that he's going to run to us, but he says he will come to us as well. He'll meet us as we come forward. And so he comes again to humility. Humble. Repentance requires humility, doesn't it? Now he turns back to 
how we act with one another again as a group. We've talked about the internal battle. Where do these sources come from? And now, take a look at the effect when I interact with those around me who were not robots, were real people with real emotions, real different experiences and thoughts. And then he says in 11, Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against the brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There's only one lawgiver and judge. He who is able to save and to destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? So what is evil? So if we can just keep what I'm going to say about you out of the evil, the evil category, it's okay? Because it sounds like there's a certain really bad level if I talk about you. But I could still say things that aren't nice. Right? I guess, as long as they're not evil, no, those are evil. We need to understand, when he talks about that, he's saying, when you talk bad about your brother or sister in Christ, it's evil. If it's not positive, it's not uplifting, it's not loving, it's wrong. Period. Period. If you're saying it under your breath, it's wrong. If you're saying it to one other person, it's wrong. It's evil. That's what he says. Don't sugarcoat it. Understand that when we speak bad things about one another, bad insinuendos about another, he says those things are evil. And then he says, or judges. And now, we do this. Why doesn't brother so-and-so come to church? Why don't they always hear? What are they doing? Why do they don't do this enough? Or they don't do that? Do you know why? This one actually caught me a few years back. And I had to really slow down because that's the way I felt about one person. They moved since then. They've been a while back. But I remember I used to always think that. I thought all those years that that person was here with us hardly ever showed up. And never really when they did show up, help us out at all. They're kind of like a full-time visitor. And I was judging him. Now, I may have been accurate. I may have been. But who am I to judge, you see? Who am I to judge somebody's motives on why they're doing something or not? That is why we have God. And that's what he really does conclude with by saying... There's one lawgiver, there's one judge, and that one can destroy and save. Can you? Can you? You're going to play judge, but you don't have the power to execute the position in which you say you have authority to judge somebody. But he does. He does. So that's where we're at to this point in the book. We'll pick it up next week. So I hope these lessons have been good and beneficial to you. If you're here this evening, there's something we can do to help you in your relationship with Christ, whether becoming a Christian by being baptized or praying with you. Hope you'll take this moment to reflect within. And if you'd like to, let us know so that we can help you. So think